Brother, I'm going to continue on with the, the Sabbath. We're gathered here today to keep God's holy Sabbath. But the majority of Christians will gather in their churches tomorrow on Sunday. Could we be worshiping God on the wrong day? Which day should we gather together as a congregation of God's called out ones? The church. Today we're going to explore the change of the Sabbath to Sunday to see if it, it truly was. And if it was changed, who authorized it? God, Jesus, the apostles, or man? I always look to the Word of God to determine if there was a legal shift of the Sabbath to Sunday. The title is Sabbath or Sunday? Sabbath or Sunday? With a question mark. You understand why I chose the word Sabbath over Saturday when we look at the days of the week. <clears throat> so when is the Sabbath? Is the Sabbath now to be held on Sunday or is it still on the seventh day of the week? What does the scriptures tell us? Exodus chapter 20. Y'all knew I was going there, right? Exodus chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 8, where God is speaking, you know, with his own voice. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the eternal, your God. The seventh day of the week is the Sabbath day. God told them to remember the Sabbath day, not just because he instructed Moses to have them gather double the manna on the sixth day because they were to rest on the seventh day, but because God sanctified the seventh day at the end of the creation week. And we can look at that in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The other days of the week were based on the Sabbath. There were no names at first for these days, just the first day of the week, the second day of the week, and so forth and so on. Only the seventh day had a name, the Sabbath. The modern week's origin is generally associated with the biblical account in the creation, according to which God labored for six days and he rested on the seventh. History shows that the ancient Israelites and the Jewish people kept a seven-day week. This is where we get our seven-day week. But not, not all did. Not all did. The Egyptians kept a ten-day week, which is another reason that God had to put the Israelites back on the correct calendar of a seven-day week when he took them out of Egypt. The Greeks, they also had a ten-day uh, week. So each month was divided into three phases of ten days associated with the waxen moon, the full moon, and the waning moon. Most likely from the descendants of Noah, who knew God, the people of Mesopotamia, the Sumerians and the Babylonians, um, they learned and they divided their year into weeks of seven days each. The Babylonians named each of the days after one of the five planetary bodies 
known to them, which was Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and also the Sun and the Moon. A custom that was later adopted by the Romans. See, everything starts in Babylon. Their influence spreads everywhere. For centuries, the Romans used a period of an eight days of civil practice. They had an eight-day week. But in 321 CE, Emperor Constantine, he established a seven-day week in the Roman calendar and designated Sunday as the first day of the week. Subsequent days bore the names of the Moon's Day, Mars Day, Mercury's Day, Jupiter's Day, Venus Day, and Saturn's Day. For example, um, Friday, Venus Day, is uh, Vernays in Spanish and Veretti in French. Uh, the Latin-based languages are all very similar and are based on the gods or the planetary bodies. In Italian, Dominica is, is Sunday, means Sunday. Uh, Dominica means belonging to God. They established that because they wanted everybody to worship God on Sunday. <clears throat> Lunedi is Monday after the moon. Uh, you know, and um, Martedi is Tuesday. That's honoring the God Mars. Um, Mercalady is Wednesday, Mercury. Uh, Giulvedi is Thursday, that's honoring Jupiter. Um, Vernerdi, honoring Venus, that's Friday. And Sabato for Saturday. Sabato. How come not Saturday? Sabato is actually derived from the Latin word Sabbatum, which itself comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, meaning Sabbath, or seventh day, which I find interesting as other nations use the translation of the Sabbath as their seventh day as well. There's many others. But we use the Roman Saturday, honoring the god Saturn, and the Italians, the, the people of Rome don't even do that. I find that kind of curious. Now the other days of the week that we know now in the English are derived from the Anglo-Saxon words for the gods of the Teutonic mythology, the Norse mythology. Uh, Tuesday comes from uh, Tu, the Anglo-Saxon name for Tyre, which was the Norse god of war. Uh, kind of equivalent to um, you know, for Tuesday, equivalent to Rome's uh, Mars, uh, Mars Day, because Mars was also a god of war. So they, they, they almost keep the, the gods in, a, in the same order there. Uh, now, Tyre was one of the sons of Odin, or Wooden, uh, the supreme deity after whom Wednesday is named. Similarly, Thursday originates from Thor's Day, the name of honor of Thor, the god of thunder. Uh, Friday was derived from uh, Frigg's day. Uh, Frigg is the wife of Odin, and she represents love and beauty in the North mythology. Uh, this replaced Venus Day, as she was a goddess of love and beauty as well. We also retain Saturday from the Romans, as this day honored the god Saturn. Uh, their version of the Greek god Kronos. And there are other equivalents to this god in other pagan religions, um, like Jeb of uh, Egypt. In Norse mythology, Saturday was named Lagardargi. Did I say that right? Lagardarde, which is derived from two things, wash day, which is Lagardagen, or means hot water day, or, and also from Loki's day, Loki Darg, Darger, Loki Darger. <laughs> uh, Saturday in, Nor 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 in the Norwegian uh, 
language right now is Lord Dog, which is derived from Lugardargi. <laughs> I love that word. <clears throat> but brother, I just wanted you to understand kind of where we get the names for the days of the week, as you will see that the Israelites did not name their days of the week according to the planets, the, the sun and the moon, or false gods, as we will soon see here. But also because modern uh, Christian biblical scholars try to prove that there are three passages of Scripture that proves the early church uh, during the apostles' time kept the first day of the week, Sunday, as a Sabbath rest and a worship day. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 20, and we'll begin that research. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, and I'm going to begin in verse 7. <clears throat> Acts, chapter, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now I want to read that from the complete Jewish Bible version. Acts chapter 20 verse 7. On Matzah Shabbat, when we were gathered to break bed, Shoal addressed them. Since he was going to leave the next day, he kept talking until midnight. Now the term Matzah Shabbat is Hebrew. Um, is a Hebrew word. It literally means going out of the Sabbath going out of the Sabbath. In Judaism, it refers to the time of the evening immediately following Shabbat, the Sabbath. So it it's means Saturday night. Saturday night is when they were gathered together and Paul was addressing them. It is a time when following one's declaration of the intention to end the Sabbath, um, it is permissible to resume the weekly activities that are prohibited on Shabbat. Uh, this may occur no earlier than when three small stars appear in the sky. That's how they determine when it's really completely over. Not just the sun going down, but you got at least, they don't want to take a chance, they want to at least see three visible stars. In Hebrew, Sunday is called Yom Rishon. Uh, the name is derived from the Hebrew word for head, Rosh. Uh, Sunday leads our week just as our heads lead our lives. Uh, the days of the week in Hebrew are named after cardinal numbers. Rishon, as you may have guessed, means first. Uh, Monday is Yom Shini, and it comes from the number number two, which is uh, Shenim. Might not be pronouncing all these Hebrew words correctly, but I'll give it a shot here. Uh, Tuesday is Yom Shlishi, <laughs> which comes from the number for three, um, Shosha. Wednesday is Yom Rivi, which comes from the number four. Uh, Thursday is Yom Hamishi, which is five. Friday is Yom Shishi, which comes from the number six. So they're named after the days of the week. First day of the week, second day of the week. But that's just their language. Of course, Yom means, you know, day. But wait, there's one exception to this rule. Shabbat, which is Saturday. The seventh day of the week of the Jewish day is not named after a number. The day 
To rest with your family and friends literally means he stopped. This term comes from Genesis where God stopped his work on the seventh day. The common practice today is that the day begins at midnight. But in many parts of the world, it, it does begin at sunrise. Well, it does make sense. This is not the case in traditional Judaism. <clears throat> the Jewish day begins after sunset and not at sunrise or midnight. There are a few places in the Bible that refer to the day as a period of time between one evening and the next. Uh, to be exact, the start of the day begins after three stars are visible. They, they come out in the night sky. Now I want to read to you those same, the same verse there, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. But I want to read out of the Orthodox Jewish Bible. Their word for Acts here is Javarat. So, Javarat chapter 20, verse 7. And on Yom Rishon, which I already said is the first day of the week, Yom Sharon, when we met for Tish, uh, Tish means table or public feast. And in parentheses, they have it. It was mat Matzah Shabos when there was a Meleve Malke, communal meal, breaking of the bread. They actually had a name for it when you broke bread um, and had a meal after the Sabbath. It was, a, it was almost like a formal thing that they would have, and it was called Meleve Malke. And this is what they were doing. They were just having a regular meal, breaking bread. It says, Rav Shaul, that's, they're talking about Paul here. <laughs> Shaul is his, um, his name in Hebrew. Was saying, uh, Shur, which means designated amount, to them since he would have to depart early the next day and was having to extend a message until Shetzo Halala, <laughs> which means midnight. I'm not even going to try to say that word again. I might, might have got it wrong. But <clears throat> see, it's very clear from the subsequent verses that Paul and his companions, they treated this as the first day of the week, beginning at sundown after three little stars, <clears throat> as a normal work day. Paul's companions, they sailed around a peninsula from Tros to Asos, which is mentioned in verse 13. So they wanted Paul to go on the ship with them, to go around that way, but Paul decided he was going to walk. Now, them sailing around... This was a distance of about 50 to 60 miles. Well, they had to go around the peninsula there of the western part of Turkey. Well, Paul walked a foot over land more than, more than 19 miles, which is mentioned in verse, uh, verses 11 and 14. So he walked. His companions were engaged in the labor of rowing and sailing a boat. While Paul was preaching that, Saturday night. Then at break of day in the morning, he set out to walk from Treos to Asos, a good hard day's work. He would not do this except if it was on a common weekly work day. So this is not talking about a Sabbath that they would have been keeping. It's not talking about Sunday being a Sabbath. Sunday, the first day of the week, was a work day according to them. And Paul was not setting an example here of keeping Sunday as a holy Sabbath day or a replacement for the Sabbath. 
This was a special gathering in the evening after the Sabbath to say farewell to Paul because he was on his way to Jerusalem. This was just after the Days of Unleavened Bread and he wanted to get to Jerusalem before Pentecost. So that's what he was trying to that's what he was trying to do. So they were saying goodbye. And the other thing that's interesting about the, the breaking of the bread, a lot of people think when you break bread, it means you're having a church service or actually you're taking the Eucharist or the communal offering and stuff like that. That's what they believe. But in the Hebrew, I mean, and even in these Greek words, breaking bread just meant having a meal. Because they had a meal, they broke bread that evening, and after... He went there because, uh, I look here, and uh, in this story there's about this young man, he, Eutychus, um, he, was, uh, he fell asleep. He was sitting there on the windowsill, and he fell asleep, and Paul was going on and on and on and on. <laughs> so he... He fell asleep and he fell out the window. You know, Paul went down there and he put his body over him and he healed him. He brought him back to life. And then they went back in and they broke bread again. Because they were eating. They were hungry. He was on he was on going on a journey. So I just wanted to stress that the breaking of bread has nothing to do with um, you know, taking the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. Now the next passage that is used to prove Sunday worship is the collection for the saints that Paul asked the congregation in Corinth as well as other church areas to do for those in need in Jerusalem. Um, that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 if you would like to turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there will be no collections when I come. And when I come, whoever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. This is the, these are the verses in question here. This verse, these verses do not say anything about worshiping or holding services on a Sunday. Verse 1 tells us what kind of collection is being made. A collection for the saints. First, it is a collection. It's not for the preacher, not for evangelism, not for church expenses, but it's for the saints. The members of the church in Jerusalem were suffering from a drought and famine. They needed not money, but food. They needed food. They were starving. They were in need. Notice that Paul had given similar instructions to other churches as he tells the Romans, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it, is, for it pleased those in Macedonia and Achaia, which where Corinth was located, to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are at Jerusalem. Therefore, when I have performed this, I have sealed to them this fruit. I shall go by way of you to Spain. Talk about what he's doing afterwards. This is Romans chapter 15, verses 25 through 28, if you want to jot that down and look at that later. It was not money but fruit that was being prepared for shipment to the poor saints, the poor church brethren, 
in Jerusalem. The Greek word can also refer to grain, wine, or other produce that can be stored a long time without spoiling. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Paul does Paul say that they should give money at a church service? Not at all. He says, let each one of you lay up something aside, storing up. Notice this, he is telling them to put something aside for a special use, to store it at home. Why? Because Paul didn't want any collecting done when he arrived. He wanted this gift for Jerusalem church to be ready for shipment. He says, in verses 3 and 4, he says, when I, when I come, whomever, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they, meaning more than one, will go with me. Apparently, it was going to require several men to carry this collection, gathered and stored up to Jerusalem. If it were a tithe or an offering of, you know, for the ministry to spread the gospel, you know, Paul could have carried the money alone. But he needed help. It was fruit they were taking, supplies, food. Thus, once again, the first day of the week is a work day. A day of gathering fruit and food out of the orchards, the fields, the gardens, and for storing it up. This labor was done to be done on the first day as soon as the Sabbath was passed. The next passage that is used to prove Sunday as a day of worship is found in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, it says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle, island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. The Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. This one scripture, in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, where John wrote, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, is commonly cited to justify Sunday worship. Some believe this means John was worshiping on Sunday and he had a vision on that day. But nowhere does the Bible define Lord's, the Lord's Day as the first day of the week. As a matter of fact, it is the only place this term is used in the Bible, which would hardly be the case if the church had been observing Sunday for years, as some contend. However, most Bible commentators push the belief that the Lord's Day is the same as Sunday when Christians are to worship Jesus. I'm going to read some of those commentaries. Um, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown's uh, Bible commentary on the subject of the Lord's Day. He says, Though forcibly detained from the church communion and the brethren in the sanctuary on the Lord's Day, the weekly commemoration of the resurrection, John was holding spiritual communion with them. This is the earliest mention of the term the Lord's Day. These commentators, that's what he said, these commentators believe that John was holding a church service when this occurred. Well, we just read the scripture. There's no mention of anyone else being there. There's no mention of him at a church service. He was on the island and he had this vision. 
He wasn't conducting services and all of a sudden had a vision. John Gill's exposition of the Bible on I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, commenting, says, not the Jewish Sabbath, which was now abolished, nor was that ever called the Lord's Day. And had John meant that, he would have said on the Sabbath day, much less the Jewish Passover, but the first day of the week is, des is designed. So the Ethiopic version renders it on the first day. And it's so called, just as the ordinance of the supper is called the Lord's Supper, being instituted by the Lord and the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. And that because it was the day in which our Lord rose from the dead. So is this talking about the Sabbath or Sunday or none of the above? If this was referring to a day of the week, we would have to conclude that John meant the seventh day since God called the Sabbath my holy day, the holy day of the Lord, in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. And Jesus Christ said he was the Lord of the Sabbath, in Mark chapter 2, verse 28. Not some other day of the week. To get a clear understanding of these, this phrase, the Lord's day, once again we're going to look at the Orthodox Jewish Bible. Hisgalus, that means revelation. Hisgalus, chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Ruach, Hakadesh, in the spirit, on Yom, Yom Ha'adan, and heard behind me a cold gaudo, a loud voice, like a blast of a shofar. <clears throat> It's actually easier, easier to read the NIV, which I'm going to do here. <laughs> no. <clears throat> so basically, what, he's talking about uh, Yom Ha'adan, which means the Lord's Day. Or does it? And in this, they refer to Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 12. Where it says, Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a loud rumbling sound as the glory of the eternal rose from the place where it was standing. Which is similar to what John is experiencing here. Now the complete Jewish Bible, verse 10 says, I came to be in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. Not the Lord's Day, but the Day of the Lord. Now, the Companion Bible, the Companion Bible uh, that was written by E.W. Bullinger, says the Lord's Day equals the Day of the Lord, according to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. It says, For the Day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, that is Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. But he says the Lord's day is, means the day of the Lord. The Hebrew terms for which are equivalent to the Greek, he kyriak hemera, I mean the Lord's day. He said basically the occurrences here, he mentions, he mentions, uh, we're, we're going to look at these scriptures, so. But we, he mentioned uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, and he also mentions uh, 2 Peter uh, 3.16. But in his comments, and saying this was the day of the Lord, he says, not our Sunday. He says it's the Lord's day. It's not referring to our Sunday. Let me read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. It says, for, your, for you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by the Spirit or by the Word or by the letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So Bollinger is mentioned in these you know, verses here, but he also mentions uh, 2 Peter Chapter 3, verse 16, since this is where Peter is telling the people they were twisting Paul's words. But he also, if you look at, before that, Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief over the night. He's saying that too. But in verse 16, he says, as also in all his epistles, talking about Paul, speaking in them of these things which are some things hard to understand. And untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So Bollinger here is saying that that's exactly what people are doing with these verses that I just went through. They're twisting it to try to make it look like we're supposed to be worshiping on Sunday, that somehow the apostles changed that and decided to do that. Now, Bulger's comments, I wanted to mention one more thing on the trumpets from this verse. Um, it says in the Old Testament, it's connected with war in the day of the Lord, which makes sense. You know, John was in a vision. He was there on the day of the Lord, which means he was there to see the things that were going to happen as Jesus is getting ready to come back to earth. And there's a sound of the trumpet. In Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14, it says, That great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter, and the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I want to read the scripture one more time in the Weymouth uh, version of the Bible. It says, In the Spirit I found myself present on the day of the Lord, and I heard behind me a loud voice which resembled the blast of a trumpet. The context of John's vision shows that John wasn't referring to a day of the week at all. Instead, he meant the vision transported him into the future time when the Bible reveals elsewhere that this is the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the day of Christ. And there's other scriptures that say this. I read three of them already. If you want to jot these other ones down, Jeremiah chapter 46 and verse 10. Um, Acts chapter 2 verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8. Chapter 5 verse 5. And 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 14. These terms are not speaking of a a specific single day. Instead, they refer to end time period when Jesus Christ will return to intervene in human affairs personally and directly. Thus, these terms indicate the end of the age of man's self-rule and the beginning of the age of God's rule over all the nations through Christ. I hope we can clearly see through the scriptures that there is no precedence to keep Sunday holy over the Sabbath day, and that there was no change that was authorized by God, Jesus Christ, or the apostles. However, Sunday, a day that has always been associated with worshiping the sun and the many sun gods, did replace the holy Sabbath day which God commanded his people, his children, to observe. 
But this change did not originate with the apostles and is not taught by the New Testament. Peter, John, and Jude all warned that false teachers will infiltrate in the church and spreading heresies. Worshiping on the first day of the week was probably one of those as Sunday worship did spread to many churches. Around 150 CE, Justin Martyr wrote, On the day called Sunday, all who live in the cities or in the country gather together in one place, and the members of the memoirs of the apostles for the writings of the prophets are read. Sunday is the day on which we hold our common assembly because it was the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world, and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day rose from the dead. Again, this is from a statement from Justin Martyr in his first apology. He should apologize. I'm sorry. Couldn't resist that. Sunday does not really honor Christ's resurrection because Jesus did not rise from the grave on Sunday. When Mary came to the tomb, she arrived there before sunrise, well before sunrise on that Sunday morning, and she found that he had already risen. He had already risen the night before. You can see that account in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. Other church historians document the fact that by the middle of the 2nd century, Sunday had become the prominent day of worship. There were many who tried to justify the change from Sabbath to Sunday. One of the greatest deceptions was about the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Christian church leaders decided how to categorize the law by dividing God's law into three categories, the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. The Bible doesn't divide them that way. Man does. The Bible division is commandments, statutes, and judgments, which is mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 54 through 58 when Solomon was blessing the assembly. Now by following this method of reasoning, the moral laws, which the ones which you can keep, or should keep, or they say you should keep, are the commandments and laws which have their basis in the character of God, such as thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal. Uh, moral laws are generally considered to be based on God's own character and therefore enforced today. Now the laws in the Bible which are ceremonial or civil in nature are not universal moral laws. Civil laws can vary from nation to nation. On the other hand, ceremonial laws concerning activities that may be okay sometime but not okay another time. For instance, killing a animal for burnt offering could be done lawfully only by the Levitical priesthood. But we can burn a barbecue in our backyard. They explain that the ceremonial laws apply only to the Jews, like the sacrifices. Those are the ones you should, should not keep because they have been done away with due to the ending of the Old Covenant. The fourth commandment forbids working on a particular day, the Sabbath or Saturday. Now here they have engaged some really creative theology. Since working isn't a sin the rest of the week, work isn't contrary to God's character like murder and theft would be. So they reason that the Sabbath commandment is not a moral law and hence it must be ceremonial. They also said that the, Jesus viewed it as ceremonial and a lesser law. They taught that we have our rest in Jesus Christ. But let's look at some of the evidence that they provided. 
They say that God himself does not keep the Sabbath as a six-day, one-day cycle of work and rest. <laughs> He's God. He did not before creation. He does not now. Angels do not keep a weekly Sabbath either. In the new heavens and the new earth, when there is no nighttime, no one will have to change their behavior according to the days of the week. Everyone will be in God's eternal rest all the time. The last part may be correct, as everyone will be a spiritual being like God in Christ in the new heavens and new earth. Although the seventh-day Sabbath has a basis in that God did once, the 6-1 cycle does not reflect what God is eternally. They claim the seventh-day Sabbath is not a universal or eternal law. Uh, some argue that Jesus kept the Sabbath, and their reply was that Jesus did many things based on his Jewish heritage, but we do not do those things today. Yes, Jesus kept the Sabbath, and so did his apostles and his disciples after his death and resurrection to life. Brethren, the, the New Testament writers, they wrote their Gospels and their letters beginning more than 20 years, sometimes 30 years, after Jesus rose to heaven. In the case of John, it's even more. It's over 60 years afterwards. Yet they tell of them keeping the Sabbath in the holy days, like Pentecost. If Jesus had truly abolished the Sabbath, and they were aware of it, wouldn't they have told us, the readers, in their messages. But they emphasized the Sabbath by keeping it and writing about it. However, many were led away from the truth and turned to keep in Sunday. Many did so to avoid the persecution of the, the Christians. But that all changed when Emperor Constantine the First pagan sun worshiper, came to power in 313 CE. He legalized Christianity and made the first Sunday-keeping law. His infamous Sunday enforcement law of March 7, 321, reads as follows. On the vulnerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed, as according to the Codex Justinianus, um, by, written by Philip Staff, the history of the Christian church. The Sunday law was officially confirmed by the Roman papacy. Uh, the Council of Laodicea in uh, 364 CE decreed, Christians shall not Judaize or be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor. And as being Christians shall, if possible, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. As according from Strand, um, he's, he's citing a uh, chart. Um, he lived in the history of the Council of the Church. That's where I got that information from. Around 400 CE, Augustine, a re very respected um, Catholic theologian, proclaimed that the holy doctors of the Church have decreed that all glory of the Jewish Sabbath is transferred it to Sunday. It says, let us therefore keep the Lord's day as the ancients were commanded to do the Sabbath. Again, this is quoted by uh, Robert Cox in the Sabbath Laws and Sabbath Duties that he wrote in 1853. The Catholic Encyclopedia, um, the section on Sunday, mentions uh, St. Caesarius, I guess that's how you say it, Caesarius of Arles uh, enforced enforcing this uh, teaching in the 6th century as well. These men put the changing of the Sabbath into the hands of the doctors of the church, the post-apostolic um, church officials. 
In its section on the Ten Commandments, the Catholic Encyclopedia says, the church, on the other hand, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment, we, we count it as the fourth commandment, but you know that how they rewrote that, um, referred to Sunday as it to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Now here's another instance where, which, in which Sunday worship was put into practice back, based on the Roman Catholic Church's claim of authority to change a scriptural principle. Again, mainstream church authorities will assume is what the apostles wanted. Other Catholic writers made it clear that Sunday services and worship are not endorsed by the biblical teachings, but only by their church's authority. The Catholic University, or I'm sorry, the Catholic Universe Bulletin said in 1942, the church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. The Protestant claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. <laughs> they actually praise in the Seventh-day Adventists because they are actually keeping the Sabbath. The Protestants that all left out were still keeping Sunday that they changed. The Catholic um, Virginia said in 1947, All of us believe many things in regard to religion that we do not find in the Bible. For example, nowhere in the Bible do we find that Christ or the apostles ordered that the Sabbath be changed from Saturday to Sunday. We have the commandment of God given to Moses to keep holy the Sabbath day. That is the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Today, most Christians keep Sunday because it is what, because it has been revealed to us by the church outside the Bible. Thomas Aquinas, a very influential uh, theologian, wrote, In the new law, the observance of the Lord's Day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath, not by virtue of the precept, but by the institution of the church and the custom of Christian people. See, these examples make it clear that the Sabbath was not changed to Sunday by Jesus Christ or the apostles, but rather by those who believed that they had the authority to change biblical principles. Since Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it is hard to understand why a change Christ never authorized was made. Sunday became the primary day of rest and worship, although the concept of rest has largely disappeared as most denominations continue to hold their worship services on Sunday, but they do not obey the law of resting from work. Um, the Orthodox Christians do. <clears throat> but you can search throughout the Bible and you will find no authority to alter the day of worship from the Sabbath to Sunday. James uh, Cardinal Gibbons, a Catholic educator and the Archbishop of Baltimore in the late 1800s to early 1900s, was very blunt about the change. He says, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The, scripture, the scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctified. The Catholic Church correctly teaches that our Lord and his apostles inculcated certain important duties of religion which are not recorded by the inspired writers. 
We must therefore conclude that the scriptures alone cannot be a sufficient guide and rule of faith. And that was written in uh, Faith of Our Fathers in, in Baltimore in 1917. Did you grasp that? The writer admits that Sunday observance was nowhere authorized in the Bible and that the seventh day is the only day sanctified by the scriptures. His justification for changing the day rest a day of rest and worship assumes that the authority exists apart from the Bible and to divine the necessary truths and the practice for salvation. Try to say that the apostles believed this, but they never wrote it down. Pope Leo XIII in an 1894 letter said, We, the popes, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. In an 1895 Catholic newspaper, the Catholic um, National said, The Pope is not only representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. The church in Rome believed that they had the divine uh, right and authority to change the Sabbath to Sunday. And even the Protestants kept it, even though the authority was from the Catholic Church that they came out of, and not by the authority of God. The church in Rome discarded the Holy Scriptures about the Sabbath, ignored the practice of Jesus and his disciples in keeping the Sabbath and the law. While the practice of the apostles were being banned, traditions from other religions were being incorporated and relabeled as Christian. Um, writes, writing here, a um, historian um, John Romer says, Subtly, so subtly that the bishops themselves had not seen them, the old gods had entered their churches like the air of the Mediterranean. And they live still in Christian ritual. In the iconograph, the iconography, that's a hard word to say, and the festivals of Christianity. The ancient sign of life, the Ankh, which the gods carried in their sculptures for thousands of years was easily transformed into the Christian cross. The figure of Isis nursing her child Horus, the Isis lactans, became the figure of the virgin with Jesus at her breast. He continues on in another section. He says, At Rome, Romulus and Remus were swapped for the biblical saints Peter and Paul. And still in the 5th century, the Pope had to stop the early morning congregation of St. Peter's from walking up the church steps backwards so that they would not offend Saul, the rising sun god. He had to go out there and stop them because they were still honoring the sun god. Romer continues in um, one more statement from him in his, uh, in his book, Testament, the Bible and History, which was written in 1988. He says, similarly, uh, 25, uh, 25th of December, now Christ's birthday, was also the day of Sol Invictus, the Unconquered Sons Festival, celebrated by cutting green branches and hanging little lights on them. And presents were given out in God's in the God's name. Sol's weekly festival, Sol Day, Sunday, became the Christian Sabbath. Jesus warned us that this would happen. Notice the anonymous tone of his warnings to his followers. In Matthew chapter seven, verse fifteen. Matthew chapter seven, verse fifteen. Beware of false prophets 
who come to you in sheep's clothings, clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. He also explained in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus knew that some would feign obedience in his teachings, but their actions would reveal their motives. He says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? He asked them in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. One of the things that biblical scholars and Christians do not get or seem to understand, although it's obvious, is that Jesus taught his disciples the word of God, which were his words, actually his words, and God the Father's words, meaning the Old Testament scriptures. There was no New Testament scriptures to follow as they weren't written yet. Duh. Jesus taught the law and the prophets and the writings to his disciples. Jesus said he was the Lord of the Sabbath. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. He warned us that some would lead us away from the truth and from his teachings. Paul also writes to Timothy, if you want to turn to 2 Timothy as I get ready to wrap up here, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul tells Timothy, but evil men, and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. He learned them from his mother and his grandmother, as you can see in other verses in Timothy. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's referring to the Old Testament scriptures. The New Covenant did not do away with or replace God's law, which includes the Sabbath. It enhanced it. It made it spiritual for us. God's Spirit helps us to stay focused on His law as He writes them on our foreheads, our, our minds. They're with us. They're on our thoughts. They're in our hands as we strive to do what is right in a world that is wrong. God writes His laws on our hearts. As we love his law. We love his law. Psalm 119, 97, verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law. 
It is my meditation all the day. The Sabbath is a blessing, which I look forward to each week. Keeping the Sabbath is part of the law of God. It has not been done away with, nor has it been replaced with Sunday. Happy Sabbath.